Investing for dividends and cash flow, you are in the right place. I have six questions that I'm going to answer today. All six of these questions came from you guys, from the community here on PPC Ian. We are YouTube's dividend investing channel. Six really good questions about passive income today. Let's get started. All right, everyone. So the first question is a really good one. This one came through recently and the subscriber asked me, hey, Ian, I need $2,000 a month. I need $2,000 a month. That should be enough money for me to retire, for me to pursue my dreams. How can I do this with dividend stocks? And more specifically, how much money do I need to invest to achieve that goal? of generating $2,000 a month. And so this is a really good question. Now, the one thing that this subscriber did not mention is their time frame. They didn't say, hey, I wanna to retire tomorrow, or I wanna retire in 10 years, or I wanna retire in 15 years or more. And so what I did for this subscriber, and just for this uh, question in general, is I addressed it in a variety of different ways. I address it here now, 10 years out and 15 years out. I'm actually really glad about this question because it paints a picture. It paints the picture that as a dividend investor, time is on your side. Time is really important. And so if someone wants to retire off of dividends tomorrow, it's sometimes very difficult because a large lump sum of money is needed. But if one can wait, one can wait 10 years or more, oftentimes it is much easier to pursue the dividend strategy because of the fact of compounding, of compound interest, of dividend reinvestment, of um, dividends being re reinvested, and also companies raising their dividends over time. And I just did a video on this whole thing and shared a model about this, so I'll link to that in the description below. The model I actually created that I shared with everyone recently is the basis of some of my answers here. But the reason I'm so excited about this question is I often get feedback, Ian, I don't want to pursue dividend investing, or Ian, I don't want to do dividend investing because an astronomical amount of money is needed for me to live early financial freedom with dividends. And quite frankly, the people saying that, they are somewhat truthful, they are somewhat accurate, because it's true, a huge amount of money is needed capital-wise, investment-wise, if that person wants to retire tomorrow. But again, if you have time on your side, it's a completely different picture. So anyways, hypothetically speaking, I want um, 2,000 a month or 24,000 a year. How do I do this? Well, if I want to retire tomorrow, most likely what I would do now basically is I would comprise a basket of high yielding stocks. I would pick conservative stocks. I'd probably pick a bunch of utilities and slower growing stocks, but those that pay a lot of yield right now. One of the stocks actually that is in the utility space, regulated electric utility, both in the US and the UK that I like is PPL Corporation. I don't own this one yet, but it's on my watch list. We'll get to that a little bit later. But anyways, PPL, they're yielding about 5.24%. And so if I bought stocks like PPL, I bought a basket of those stocks, and maybe my average yield was a 5.24%, what happens is I basically take my 24,000, I divide by 5.24%, or in other words, 0 0.0524, and it tells me, it tells me how much capital I need to invest to push through that yield, to, to achieve that yield that I need right now. Anyways, if I take 24,000, I divide by 5.24%, which is PPL's current yield, which I think is a yield I can get if I arrange a basket of high yielding utilities right now in this market, we need to invest $458,000. And so the, um, the fact of the matter is for most people, that's going to be a little bit difficult. So someone who wants 2000 a month wants to retire now, look, it's true, there's a lot of money required. In this alone, they don't see these columns. Most people look at that and they're like, hey, dividend investing, I'm not even gonna try. Dividend investing, it's, it's just too hard. It requires too much capital. Well, one answer, by the way, before I even get to these columns, is it's not an all or nothing thing. So this person's saying they need 2,000 a month, but would it be life-changing for them to have 
$500 a month or $250 a month, maybe $1,000 a month. There are shades of gray in financial freedom. It's not either, oh, I made it or I have nothing. There are, there are stopping points on that journey, on that path, and someone can start achieving partial financial freedom and enjoying the benefits of financial freedom before they get to the destination. And so that's answer number one, whereas I don't think for most people they have to achieve their full, their full goal right away. They can start enjoying the journey and they can start getting towards their goal and generating passive income because even $50 a month, few hundred dollars a month for someone who's living on two thousand dollars a month if they can automate that if they can drive that through passive income that is fewer hours that they have to work throughout the work week that they can reclaim and start enjoying more out of life thanks to the magic of dividends so that's one nuance here i want to point out and i think is totally overlooked because a lot of people just look at the end goal they see how much money needs to be invested to reach that and it sometimes uh, strikes them with fear that they're just not going to get there. And so for me, I like to celebrate the milestones along the way. And I totally believe that um, there, there are shades of gray because someone can, it's not, oh, I'm, I'm going to have nothing or I'm going to have my full goal. No. What if I can pay for all of my vacations with dividends? That's something that I'm working towards right now. Well, I can do it right now, but um, I'm creating, I don't think it's a prudent use of the, cap, the cash flow I have now. The portfolio I've now is meant to pay everyday bills and I'm reinvesting the money for now until we need it to try to grow the snowball quickly. But I'm creating a separate fund, if you will, to pay for all of our vacations. And our vacations are total expenses. No, but by getting those taken care of, it's going to improve our financial situation so much and just make life more enjoyable and allow us, quite frankly, to go on more vacations. Anyways, that's the nuance, the first nuance. But the second nuance is Look, if you have time on your side, the magic of compound interest means that much less capital needs to get invested. And so this is where I'll link to the spreadsheet in the description below in this video as well, just so you can, you can get it. But I did a spreadsheet recently, and this is through the lens of 3M Company, a company I own, ticker symbol MMM. They make this whiteboard. And 3M is um, a company that grows its dividend quickly, 11% on average for the last five years. And what's great about 3M is it also has a reasonably good starting yield. It's somewhere in the 3.5% uh, range. Anyways, if I buy 3M now, 3 point, and I need to retire tomorrow, I probably wouldn't do that because 3.5% is not going to give me as much yield, as much money as PPL, which is at 524 And so I'd have to put in even more money into 3M. But let's say I have 10 years. The model that I linked to in the description below, what's so excited, is exciting over those 10 years, there's a few things that happens. One, 3M pays dividends. I reinvest those dividends back to buy more shares of 3M. Two, 3M raises its dividend each year. And so as 3M raises, raises the dividend, I start receiving more and more cash flow. And I am, re again, reinvesting all that cash flow to buy more shares of 3M. And so it's this compounding snowball, if you will. And so look, what the model basically shows is 10 years out, the potential yield on cost for 3M is about 13%. And the way I arrive at that, again, is this is not just the simple yield on cost, not just the yield on cost about uh, raising the dividends, but it includes reinvested dividends in there as well. And what yield on cost is, for those that are newer to the channel, is it basically means I invest this capital and the, um, the dividends that I'm receiving in the future, if I take those and I divide by how much I actually invested, it gives the yield that I'm getting, the dividend yield on the actual cost. And this is a key concept because 3M, it's only yielding 3.5% now, but if I reinvest all my dividends and big assumption here, they continue to raise their dividend 11% per year on average, it probably won't be quite that high, but that's what it has been the last five years. Anyways, 10 years out, my yield on cost is 13%. And so what does this mean? If I take the um, $24,000 a year I need and I divide by that yield on cost, the 13%, what it tells me right now what I need to invest is um, $184,000. And so this is 
Such a critical point. I know I'm starting the video today with a lot of math, and I know not everyone here wants to get into all the math details right away, and I've been doing a lot of math lately, so I thank you guys for hanging in there. But this is so critical because most people, they don't see this. They just see this. They look at this column. They're like, hey, I need to put 458000 in. I don't have it. I'm out. And again, they don't look at that nuanced gray area where they can get partial financial freedom by just getting started. Um, they're just out. But what people don't realize is if they have time on their side, if they take advantage of compound interest, of dividend growth investing, the growth rates, the snowball effect, these are all synonyms that people use um, to describe the magic of dividend investing, a lot less investment is needed. And so if someone needs to retire, it can, can wait. They can wait 10 years instead of investing 458, they can get by investing 184. Now, they, you may be thinking, hey, I still don't have 184. That's too much. Okay, push retirement out another five years. And so if someone can wait 15 years, that 184 now goes down to 85, 85,000. And I think for most people here on this channel, yeah, $85,000 is a lot of money, but that is doable. That is doable for a lot of people watching here. And it may not be doable as a lump sum, but it's certainly doable over a course of years of hard work, doing side hustles, earning extra money, cutting expenses down, and getting capital into the market. And the beauty of dividend growth investing is the yield on cost potentially on 3M just 15 years out is 28%. This again is not just the simple yield on cost, it includes reinvested dividends along the way. And so if I can wait 15 years, instead of investing 458,000 to pay my 24,000 a year, I can invest 85,000, I can let it reinvest, let it do its compounding thing, and then in 15 years enjoy a 28% yield on cost and I can use um, that money to pay my, pay my bills. I'll have my 24,000. And so the key here is the element of time. And again, people write off dividend investing because they don't see this, they just see this. But the key thing that I want the community to be aware of here is one, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You don't have to get 100% to the goal. Even getting halfway there is very notable and is life-changing, life-altering. But two, Time makes such a difference, such a difference. And so, yeah, 85000 is still a lot of money, but it's going to be a lot easier for most people to come up with that amount of money than $458,000. And so, great question. I know this is kind of confusing. There's a lot going on here. To simplify this, check out the spreadsheet in the description again. So that's subscriber question one. I want to move along here. That was the most technical one today. Subscriber question two. This one, I believe, came through Twitter. So by the way, I'll link in the description below. I'm on Twitter. I uh, did a tweet a few days ago. I think it was yesterday, actually, asking people to provide questions because I'm going to be doing questions in my next video. I got a lot of questions. And so thank you guys. Eventually, I'll get to all of them. I had to pick a few of them here because I can only do six questions in today's video late at night really tired, ran 10 miles earlier today, and it's Friday, and so I'm ready ready for the weekend. But um, so, so I decided to do six in the video today. Anyways, this one says, do dividend investors need to do anything special or worry about a market correction of 10% or more? I love this question because a lot of the people in the community here are newer to investing, and I've been around doing this for over 20 years. I have seen it all, I've experienced it all, I've lost money, I've made money, and so I've experienced volatility in the market. And I do believe a crash is coming. I believe the crash will be fueled by the exuberant level of government and corporate debt. I will link in the description below. I did a whole video on this a while ago. I don't know when the crash is gonna come. It could be tomorrow, it could be a year from now, it could be five years from now, but there will be a recession and the stock market in parallel with the recession will correct, it may even crash. And so when the stock market does crash, it took me a long time to get here. In my earlier days, I used to watch my account balance and boy, when I saw it go down, it hit the ego. These days, I don't worry about my account balance as much 
because I know that if stocks are going down, I get better starting yields and I get to financial freedom quicker as long as I buy quality companies that can continue to pay and raise their dividend despite economic cycles. And so I own 40 dividend stocks, by the way. Anyways, um, 10%, that's nothing. In my opinion, and I'm not trying to be rude to the person asking the question either, but I know a lot of people out here, I think this is a very important question, are potentially concerned if they, if they woke up tomorrow morning and their stock brokerage account was worth 10% less than it is now, that would be a big deal. So first and foremost, if that would be a big deal to you, you really ought to look at in your investing strategy holistically and understand how much risk you're willing to take on because 10% fluctuations, pretty common, um, not much. Personally, I'm prepared to lose half my money uh, in terms of uh, lose on paper in terms of capital. In the next crash, if the market literally gets cut in half, I am prepared for that. I'm not concerned about that. I'm re you, it may hit my ego a little, but I'm ready for that. And that's the kind of volatility as long-term investors, as disciplined investors, that I think it's important to, to embrace and to be ready for. Anything can happen in this market, especially that it has been fueled by so much quantitative easing. There is so much debt out there at insurmountable levels. It's going to create more and more volatility. Will we get past all of this? Absolutely. I believe in the resiliency of the economy. Uh, I believe in the innovation. I believe in the companies that I own. And so I'm real long-term. I'm looking 50 years out. I'm looking forever. I'm looking multi-generational. And so the... Um, the fact of the matter, though, is just psychologically, don't prepare yourself for 10%. 10% is, 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 could just happen in one day. I'm, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's not much in my opinion. Prepare yourself for 50% and kind of wrap your head around that. What would you do if your stock portfolio were down 50%? And so anyways, though, it, the question is asking, do, do, do dividend investors need to do anything special? The only thing, there's a few things special. One maybe have some cash on the sidelines. So I've historically not been as good at this. I like, when I get cash, I like to just deploy it. The reason I do that is I might otherwise waste the cash. It may not go to the best purpose. And I just like buying stocks. It's kind of um, just a fun thing for me. I like to go shopping for stocks. But that being said, I always keep a little bit of cash and uh, I'm talking above and beyond emergency fund stuff. I'm talking about for market deployment. And so if you're the kind of person that um, has a lot of patience and wants to take advantage of a falling market, perhaps stockpile a little bit of cash. When stocks go down, you can buy them up. If you're following me on Twitter, you'll see I've done this with 3M recently. I've bought 3M a few times at uh, some really low prices. The lowest I got, I think, was about $160 really um, happy with that. So the other thing is just reinvest. I like to reinvest my dividends. And the reason I like that is in down markets, especially, even if I don't have cash on hand to buy more shares, I know the companies I do own, I'm reinvesting the dividends. And if the stock price is down, my dividends are reinvesting at really low levels. They're buying stock at really low levels. They're getting values. And so just the act of reinvesting dividends in my opinion, it's really empowering in a market crash situation. And so the other one is just long-term perspective. Again, there's going to be volatility in the market. This market has gone up, up and to the right for such a long time. This is one of the longest economic expansions, uh, stock market recoveries of all time. And so a lot of people who are newer, they've only seen it go up. And so just have a long-term perspective. Understand that corrections will come. Some will be more aggressive than others. There will be times when the portfolio value is down. But for me, it doesn't change the strategy as, at all as a dividend investor. There's nothing special necessarily I do other than, quite frankly, get a little more excited. when the I know when the stock market is down. It's That's what gets me eventually to my goal quicker. It's not buying right now. It's not buying towards the top of the market. It's certainly not buying stocks that are fairly or even overvalued at this time. That's not getting me to financial freedom quicker. What gets me there quicker is if when everyone is running and heading for the hills, I see a good value and I take advantage of it. And I guess one of the closest examples of that right now might be 3M, but imagine 3M were no longer at 166. Let's say you wake up tomorrow, it's at 80 bucks. That's the kind of thing that could potentially happen in a um, real heavy crash situation. And buying 3M at 80 bucks, 
when everyone else is heading for the hills, that's the kind of thing that is life altering. And that's the kind of thing, quite frankly, that going back up here to the top could get this person their $2,000 a month even quicker because you're just buying deep discount sale. You're getting a really good starting yield and you let it compound a little bit. That takes this 85,000 way down, way, way down. This is all uh, precedented on the market we have now. And, and the market we have now is a, oh, more or less a pretty expensive one. And so this is another good question. But um, yeah, that, that's, that's what I would do personally as a dividend investor with a, um, with a market correction. All right, moving on. So question three combines actually two questions. I got one question, Ian, what's on your watch list? I got another question, Ian, what do you think is a good value right now? And so watch list, there are two stocks on my watch list. One is PPL, one is Honeywell. And so PPL, I already talked about, it's a utility. I own 40 stocks now, I'll probably be adding more. Why am I looking at PPL? I am at the point, quite frankly, where I want more current yield because we're trying to push off tapping into dividends as much as possible. As we know, if we push it off, this happens, the magic happens, the compounding, the growth, the reinvestment. But sooner or later, we will be using dividends to pay bills and it will not pay for all bills, but it will start paying for some bills. And so I'm starting to look not necessarily, I, I don't want to reshuffle the deck of what I already have, which is basically a good combination of low yield, high growth and high yield, low growth. It kind of blends in the middle. But in terms of adding net new positions and new capital, I'm starting to have a little more focus on current yield. And so that's why I'm looking at PPL. I would be uh, well served to pick up another utility. I think it's good to diversify in that space. We all saw what happened with Pacific Gas and Electric Company and the kind of risk that taking a single utility could bring to one's portfolio. And so I already own a handful of utilities. Adding another would um, not be a bad idea, especially at a five plus percent yield. And so PPL is what I'm looking at now. And in particular for the vacation fund I've been talking about as well to help uh, generate current cash flow just to uh, check that expense off, um, uh, you know, off of the um, earned income side of things forever. I want to stack the deck with some high yielders. Um, it was literally, I want to use the dividends now to pay for vacations, uh, a line item on the budget that otherwise is coming from earned income. It would be great to get that off the earned income budget and just into the dividend budget. Doing that with these high yielders is, is a great thing. But even aside from the vacation stuff, like I said, my mind these days is on high yielders because of where our life situation is. And so I like that one. Now I'll compare and contrast that. This is so funny. I also like Honeywell, which is only yielding 1.9%, but it's a solid industrial company. I reviewed it here a while ago. I'll link in the description below. It's probably time to do another re-review. This is just a company I really want to own. I want to own it at the right price because they're going the dividend quickly. It's a really solid company. Perfect kind of company that I like to own as a dividend investor. So it's on my watch list. It never kind of got into bargain territory, so that's why I haven't bought it um, yet. Um, but I am watching it and I'm waiting for you, Honeywell, to go on sale. So that's the watch list. Um, now, good buys. What are good buys right now? Uh, one is Cedar Fair, ticker symbol FUN. It's a master limited partnership that I own. It's yielding 7.5%. I just bought, a, bought some more shares recently and um, Master limited partnerships come with a lot of complexity from an accounting and tax perspective, so be aware of that. I shared it in uh, prior videos. Uh, check them out. I'll link in the description below so you can find them easily. Now, um, what's not to like about a 7.5% starting yield at these levels? Per, knowing that my overall goal is to just get more cash flow now, because I think I will have to start tapping into it sooner, um, uh, sooner or later, this is the kind of thing that just comes to the top of the deck. And I think it's a good buy because of where it's trading as well. From a valuation standpoint right now, I think it's trading at a discount. I uh, feel like in that $49 range, it's not going to go any lower. Or if it does, I'm certainly going to take advantage of that. And I just like the company. It's a top 15 favorite stock for me. It gets me the yield that I need right now. I, um, I'm seriously, seriously focused, honestly, on Cedar Fair right now. I really like this company. So uh, they, they're in the amusement park uh, business, by the way. They own and operate amusement parks throughout the United States and Canada. So the other one that I think is a good buy now is 3M. 
a starting yield of 3.5%. Very rare, uh, because this company grows the dividend quickly. And so stock trading around 166 now. I don't know, remember where the starting PE or the forward 2019 PE is. I think it's somewhere in like the 17 range. Not a bargain basement or anything. It's a good solid buy. It's a top 10 stock for me. I have bought multiple times recently. I will continue to buy. I uh, think this company 30 to 50 years out at these levels is just a fabulous buy. So I have been buying this recently. And you would know that, by the way, if you follow me on Twitter, check it out. I'll link in the description below. I share these um, these trades on, on uh, Twitter. Another one, Legged and Platt, did a video on this uh, recently. I'll link in the description below. 4.3% starting yield. Trading at a reasonable PE. I don't remember what the PE is right now. Didn't write it down, but check out the video I just did. I like Leggett and Platt. They're under some pressure right now, as are a lot of different industrial companies like Leggett, 3M. And the reason they are is they're, look, we're headed in, I think at least, we're started to head into a recession here. And so a lot of B2B companies out there making large B2B purchases, they're delaying those purchases. They're being careful with their capital spending. And quite frankly, a lot of these companies are starting to realize, hey, I got to clean up my balance sheet. And so instead of making investments in the company instead of making uh, capital expenditures they're quite frankly using cash flow to st start to tighten up the balance sheet because a lot of the companies out there they realize that the buybacks the debt levels balance sheets are getting a little bit messy and so that's what's happening as well anyways needless to say companies like 3m leggett are on sale leggett's a smaller position for me it's a not a top 10 not a top 15 company so i uh, i bought some recently but not a lot um Probably not going to go too heavy on it in 2019 because my core focus this year is top 15 holdings. I want to focus on the core. That said, I think it's a reasonable buy. The last one I would say is SIN stocks. SIN stocks are a uh, bargain right now, all of them. They're all on sale. And uh, one of them, BTI, is a 7.4% yield. The reason I'm not buying SIN stocks now, I, I did pick up a few shares of some of my favorite SIN stocks. I think it was late last year in 2018. It might have been early this year. I don't quite remember. But um, I'm not doing it is because they're already such a big percentage of my pie. I have a huge exposure to SIN stocks. I don't want that exposure to get too big from a risk management perspective. If I had a much smaller exposure, I would be all over them now, and I think they're a good buy. It's a segment of the market that everyone hates right now. There's a lot of negative news out there. But look, these guys have been through it all. They will be just fine, in my humble opinion. They've been through so much over the years. They have always managed to figure it out. I don't think this time is any different, and um, I think they're they're a great bargain right now. But again, I'm not adding. I'm adding to fun. I'm adding to NMM, Leggett. Um, no problem on those. The sin stocks, I just can't do it because I already have so much exposure. But those are those are the ones I think are on uh, good buys right now. Now, an interesting nuance for all of you out there. Market is still reasonably overvalued, as I mentioned. But what's funny is when you own a portfolio like I do of 40 stocks, at any given time, there's a handful of stocks in the portfolio. It could be anywhere in the portfolio that are on sale. And that's what I love about having a larger portfolio in terms of number of holdings, in terms of diversification. Because at any given time, like right now, hey, not everything is on sale. McDonald's is not on sale right now. It's hitting new, new all-time highs. I wish it were. I love it. It's my number three favorite stock of all time. Huge position in it. Done very well on it. Like to buy even more. I love that stock. Love that company. But um, anyways, I, I'm not going to buy it now. It's not on sale. But uh, one day it will be and I'll buy more. But right now what's on sale are these guys. And so those are the ones I go towards. And so that's how I kind of manage my portfolio. I'm always hunting what in the portfolio is on sale. Obviously, from time to time, I add a new position too. These are the ones on the watch list. I probably won't be buying them anytime soon, but maybe I'll pick up one of them in 2019. We'll see. It'll be interesting. Uh, maybe I will. So, uh, okay, moving on. Question number four. If a stock is extremely high in... Oh, I love this because this ties into the last question. This was on Twitter again that they asked this. If a stock is extremely high in price, do I turn the drip off and selectively reinvest? Okay, so for most stocks I own, I, I reinvest the dividends and I reinvest it back in the company that paid the dividend. But the question here is, 
What if a stock is way up? It's gone way up. Ian, do you turn off the reinvestment for that stock, take the dividends and put them in something uh, that is more on sale, like, like one of these guys, one of those stocks? Now, a few things here, bookkeeping. I personally don't like to do that. One of the, the, the reasons is just McDonald's again, it's at an all time high now. What if I turn off my reinvestment a few quarters go by, I don't reinvest, but then it's at a good level again, I have to turn it back on. And then, it, then I leave it on for a while. Oh, McDonald's is too high again, I have to turn it off again. All of this turning on, turning off, it makes it harder for me just to keep my books. I like to keep my records really clean. I do it in Excel, and I just like to have those quarterly dividends coming in like clockwork from each company from a bookkeeping standpoint, because if I'm turning it on, turning it off, I'm going to have gaps. I'm going to have gaps in times when, uh, when uh, for dividends, and then I start wondering, well, did I miss a record? Why didn't I have a dividend this time? Maybe it's 10 years from now. I don't even remember what the heck was going on, and I'm looking back. I'm like, wait a minute. These two quarters, I don't have a dividend. What's wrong? Was there a mistake made? No, I'm going to avoid all of that by just keeping it clean. I just leave the div dividend reinvestment on. Now, there are certain cases like Cedar Fair, Master Limited Partnership. You have to keep really clear records for something like that. And so I don't want fractional shares. I don't want reinvestment. I don't want small lots. I only buy Cedar Fair in big lots. And so because of that, I don't reinvest there. So there's some corner cases, but I don't turn it on or off. It's just like for Cedar Fair, it's never on. I don't reinvest dividends there. And uh, anyways, uh, for most of my stocks, I just, uh, I just invest them back. This person, by the way, is asking about realty income because they're wondering the company I own, monthly dividend company, I love it. They are trading really high now. By the way, I'm reinvesting my realty income dividends, which brings me to point number two. Don't penalize winners. When a stock goes up, it's typically a reflection of the company doing reasonably well. I don't want to penalize those companies. If they're doing well, I'll buy at progressively higher prices with reinvested dividends. With new capital, net new capital, I'll oftentimes wait for a buying opportunity like I was talking about here. But for dividend reinvestment, I'll try and um, take advantage of, uh, of basically any price. If, and I don't want to penalize winners because a winner, it may keep going up. McDonald's, it may never have that correction. It may just keep going up, up, up. And I certainly don't want to penalize a winner and neglect investing, reinvesting dividends into a winner. Because if I do, I may not uh, see uh, one of these scenarios come to fruition, these really high yield on cost scenarios. They um, only happen with dividends reinvested. I don't get the huge yield on cost if I don't reinvest dividends. And so again, I don't like to penalize winners. So um, the other one is just allocation. The one time... Uh, I'll tell you the one kind of weird thing in my portfolio where I'll turn dividend reinvestment on and off. SIM stocks. Right now, I'm reinvesting dividends because they're on sale. I just cannot, I'm not putting net new capital a little bit, but right now, I'm not putting net new capital. I was a few months ago. The reason I'm not is, again, allocation. But look, I, I have dividend reinvestment on because they're trading at such low values. But as soon as those stocks start getting back up to reasonable values, could be six months from now, could be a year, could be two years, I'm turning reinvestment off and I'm doing it for an allocation reason. And so if you have a really compelling uh, pocket in your portfolio where you feel you're there's an allocation issue. Maybe you're over allocated to something that potentially carries a lot of risk, like sin stocks, like I am, Turning it on and off, it does have its time and place, and so that's how I'm using it as sin stocks. But look, when it's off, I leave it off for years. It's only going to go on when there's real good uh, bargain basement prices like there are right now. So really good question on that, and my thinking has evolved on that stuff over the years, but that's where I'm at now with dividend reinvestment. More or less, I just leave it on, let it do, it, let it do its thing, keep the books easy and clean, and my future self will thank me as 20 years from now and I'm looking through records, I just want to have like clockwork, each stock, dividend each quarter, keep it simple. Okay, so question five. What if I owned Raytheon? Oh yeah, so I just did a video on United Technology, Raytheon merger, I'll link in the description below. One of the follow-on questions was, Ian, I own Raytheon. Hypothetically, what would you do if you own Raytheon? Well, look, 
I own United Tech. I'm holding United Tech. I talked about it in the last video. I may buy some more United Tech. It's not a deep discount or a great value here. I actually put it up here. It's kind of like an okay buy. It's an okay buy. It's trading at an okay price, uh, better than most things in this market. And so I might buy some more United Tech. I bought some earlier this year at much lower prices, but it's trended up. Uh, it's starting to come down a little on this merger news, so maybe I'll get some more United Tech. But the question was, Ian, would you approach it any different if you owned Raytheon? So I'll tell you two things here. I'm going to get philosophical again. Raytheon is such a weird one. Honestly, I kind of like the acquisition. I kind of don't. I like it from a numbers perspective because Raytheon's got good numbers. Some of these activist investors, they're saying United Tech, don't buy Raytheon. It's an inferior company. These guys are incorrect in my opinion. Raytheon, when I look at it, it's, it's potentially a better run company than United Tech in, ter in terms of the balance sheet, dividend growth, cash flow growth, revenue growth, good stuff going on at Raytheon. Anyway, so because of that, kind of like the merger. I think it, it uh, actually will help United Tech. It'll, the whole thing will be really, really good. But anyways, they asked me, Ian, what if you own Raytheon? I'll tell you, I don't own Raytheon, and I probably never would own Raytheon as a standalone company because everyone has their kind of different kind of tolerances in terms. Some people, for example, they don't want to own BTI. They don't want SIN stocks. They hate this stuff. I have no problem with SIN stocks. I'm all for the consumer making wise choices, understanding what they're getting into. There's a lot of things unhealthy out there. I was talking about McDonald's earlier. Would it be healthy if I ate there three meals a day every day? Probably not. But um, look, it's, it's a nice treat once in a while and adult consumers should be able to pick where they eat and, and exercise good judgment. Anyways, I will buy most stuff out there in, in, in the market. Um, Raytheon, and quite frankly, I've avoided the defense industry, but there's good companies in the defense industry. The thing about Raytheon that kind of gets me, and I don't know all of the details, but my understanding is these guys make like really um, powerful missiles and weapons and such. And so I understand defense, there's different things that need to happen to have defense. And I think it's important for the United States and for other countries to have defense. Unfortunately, I mean, it would be nice if we lived in a world where a defense was not needed, but given the world we live in, different countries have different defense capabilities and fine, let it be. But within defense, there's different types of companies. The reason I've always enjoyed owning United Tech is one, they have a really heavy consumer angle or commercial angle rather. Their, their commercial aircraft engines is really big for them, bigger than defense. But in the defense sector, what do they do? What do they contribute? They contribute the jet engines. Great. The thing about Raytheon is they ain't contributing the jet engines to the defense sector. They're contributing the missiles. And so to the best of my understanding, among other things. And so because of those reasons, historically, like, look, I also said in the, the last video, defense I've historically stayed away from just because it's so tied to government. And what if government spending changes, this and that worries me. I like, I'd rather have a um, approach where I have a commercial end customer and there's a lot of them, more diversification. Anyways, though, in the back of my mind, it's always been like, hey, you asked me, what if I own Raytheon? I probably would never own the thing as a standalone company just from kind of that philosophical level. That said, I'm not trying to put anyone down at all. Look, I, I, I've been real honest here. I own all the SIN stocks. And so I know there's a lot of people out there that don't want to buy the SIN stocks. They don't like them. Um, they think they're really bad. And so look, I, I, um, but I own them. And so everyone out there in this community needs to make up their own mind, what they're comfortable with, what they're not. But anyways, just getting philosophical with you guys, that's probably why we would never own it standalone. But here's what's happening. If I did own it standalone, what would I do? I'd probably treat it like UTX hypothetically here. I just hold it, see what happens with the merger. I think the merger net net will be good uh, for both companies. I think it might be slightly better for UTX holders just because it's gonna help clean up the UTX balance sheet here that got a little uh, big in terms of the debt because of the whole Rockwell Collins acquisition. Um, but um, anyways, that's, that's probably what I would do. Now, still, 
I, I think philosophically, what, what will I do now with this merger? I'm just going to hold the thing. Like, look, I never would have probably bought Raytheon as a standalone company, but they're merging. It's happening. I'm a buy and hold forever, never sell kind of guy. I love my UTX. I, I'm just going to hold the thing. And so that's where I'm at. Philosophical stuff does get into play, but um, that's where I end up with the whole thing. It's just interesting as an investor. Maybe this doesn't even enter the mind of a shorter term investor, but when you're a dividend investor like me and like, like you guys out there, a lot of us are buy and hold forever and we're looking generationally or at least we're looking like 30 years out, 50 years out. And so when you do something like that, you're kind of getting attached to these companies. You're kind of marrying these companies and you're hoping that you marry something that you can feel comfortable about, you feel good about it, you like it. And like I said, I, I have no problem owning the SIN stocks. I, I actually feel great about owning them. I think they're, they're, they're fine companies. But um, with this one, it gives me a little bit pause with the UTX Raytheon, a little bit of pause. Hey, what do I think about it? End of the day, what I've kind of concluded is I wouldn't own Raytheon standalone, but it merged company. It's happening. I love my UTX. I'm just going to do it. And so is what it is. Um, that's where I'm at. But again, the real question here is what if I own Raytheon instead of UTX? Well, same thing. I, I, I buy and hold forever. Net net, I think it'll be a good merger. So moving on, the last one is Iron Mountain. Okay, I love this question. People have been asking me this question. I, I honestly think people are going to get upset here. I'm sorry. I apologize in advance. I hope I don't get thumbs down for this. <laughs> love you guys. Anyways, I know a lot of you guys own Iron Mountain, ticker symbol IRM. They pay a big dividend. It's a, a real estate investment trust company that does document management. They do a lot of stuff like they store documents. They store artwork. They got like underground vaults. They do document shredding. They do data centers. They are basically in the business of preserving records. So I'll tell you off the bat, the reason I... I kind of dismissed the thing. I'll just dismiss a stock. And so this is unique to my strategy. Maybe I'm just not open-minded enough, but the way I look at it is there's a lot of good stocks out there. If something vaguely doesn't feel that interesting to me or vaguely doesn't feel like the right thing for my portfolio, I just write it off the list. I, I don't even have to look into it because there's so many things out there. And I'll tell you, I did write Iron Mountain off the list. I started looking at their annual report though and their website, and I actually feel better about it now than I did, I probably still would never own it. And here's the reason, and again, a lot of people are gonna come back and tell me, Ian, you're wrong, I probably am, but it doesn't matter if I'm wrong because I'm right for me. I need to make decisions that, I, like I said, stocks I feel good about that I wanna hold forever, because if it's not something I wanna hold forever, the whole strategy doesn't work. The strategy only works if I'm passionate about what I own, I keep adding to it, hold it a long time so I get the yield on cost, all that good stuff. And so anyways, with, um, with Iron Mountain, the reason that I get concerned about that is a big percentage of their business is based in real estate. They own a lot of real estate. And the reason they own a lot of real estate is historically companies have given them records to store securely. Paper, literally paper records. The world is moving away from that for better or worse. Personally, I think the paper records should always stay around in addition to digital, because what if something happens with digital? What if a digital record, there's an issue? Always good to go back to paper. That being said, um, I believe the world is probably going away from paper. And so I start thinking, legacy business, all these paper records, is that sustainable? Now, Iron Mountain would answer and say, yeah, but we got data centers and we're doing it digitally now. The problem with Iron Mountain, and I, maybe I just need to do more digging, but I looked in their annual report, it's real hard for me to get a, a breakdown of their business revenue by stream. Like how much is the shredding doing? How much is the traditional paper doing? How much is the data stuff doing? How much are they making on artwork storage? I would wanna know each segment. I couldn't find that quickly. Maybe it's in there. I did a quick look, I couldn't find it. Um, the concern I have is it's doing fine now, but could this be a business that over time is just going to, are they going to be able to keep up? Uh, and that's the question. Are they going to be able to pivot into digital and be the leader in digital record preservation? This is an old world company. 
look, I own one of them. I own IBM, another old world company. And so I have nothing against old world tech, but that's the situation there. But what concerns me about these guys is it's kind of reminiscent of two companies that I, I ha used to follow very closely, Pitney Bowes and R.R. Donnelly, R.R.D. and PBI. These are two kind of older world office business B2B related companies. One was literally like the printing press doing a lot of uh, uh, printing paper. The other one was like postage meters and, and office related tech. Both of those, check out their stock charts. They have been yield traps. They, uh, for maybe five, 10 years ago, they looked really good to investors, huge yields, nothing but gone down over time. Probably some, I haven't looked at their dividends if they cut or not, but um, if they have not already, those dividends are getting cut at some point or another. And so my concern with something like an Iron Mountain is, is it more like an IBM where it's going to evolve and it's going to keep doing its thing and finding its leadership position with these data centers? Or is it more like a Pitney Bowes R.R. Donnelly? And for me, I just can't take the risk. Done. Find something else. Bam. Cedar Fair, 7.5% yield. Uh, I'll, I'll take that all day. I, I personally don't think the, the amusement park is going away. Kids, teenagers, families, always going to want something to do on a nice summer weekend. Get out of the house, go to an amusement park. And they operate some affordable ones as well. Uh, more affordable, at least, than going to like a um, Disneyland, for example. Anyways, which also is an awesome place, awesome company um, that, that I love. And so... Um, Anyways, that's where I'm at. I know I'm going to upset <laughs> some investors here. Comment below, why is Iron Mountain good? What am I missing? Like I said though, it's not only about Iron Mountain here. The reason I'm answering this question is I wanna tell you, don't be afraid just to just get it off your list. If you're not interested, if you have any concern, don't own it. Um, the, the thing is, going back to like Raytheon, my concern there, it's more philosophical, moral-related kind of stuff. I have no concern about the business performance. What I'm talking about here is on this stuff, Iron Mountain, I have legitimate concerns about the future of the business performance. If you have that about any stock, it could be a stock I own. Maybe you think Cedar Fair is going out of business. Why even entertain it for, for one minute longer? It takes so much time to analyze a company. It takes so much time to go through all of the data. If at a high level, your gut's telling you it's not for you, what I do, off the list, move on, save your time. Why focus time on something that's not right for you? But like I said, if you're in Iron Mountain, I wish you all the best. I think, uh, quite frankly, it'll probably be, be a reasonably good company. At least that's what it seems like so far based on where it's been going. But it just is not for me. And so, uh, 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 but I know there's people in the community here that own it. And I, I truly, truly, really wish you guys well. Um, and I don't know everything about everything. And you may love that segment. You may um, be passionate about data, records, that kind of stuff. You may know so much about it and it's for you and that's why. And so that's all good. Um, and you, by contrast, you may look at something like McDonald's and you'd be like, man, McDonald's, that is boring to me. Um, don't want to don't want to uh, invest in that at all. Don't want to spend one minute of my time analyzing that. And so everyone's different is what I'm trying to say. But for me, not for me, write it off the list. But again, the take home exercise for you is you've got stuff on your watch list right now. It just doesn't feel right. Clean it up. Get it off the watch list to make room, mind share for um, for different opportunities. Hey everyone, I really thank you for all of the wonderful questions. Before we leave today, in terms of a full disclosure, I own um, a lot of the stocks mentioned today. I am long IBM, ticker symbol IBM, McDonald's, ticker symbol MCD, 3M, ticker symbol MMM, Cedar Fair, ticker symbol FUN, Leggett and Platt, ticker symbol LEG, BTI, ticker symbol BTI, United Tech, ticker symbol UTX, and Realty Income, ticker symbol O. I am long on all those stocks. I own all those stocks in my personal dividend stock portfolio. Also, in terms of full disclosure, my kids both own Disney stock, ticker symbol DIS. In terms of a friendly disclaimer, today's video is not investment advice. I'm not a licensed investment advisor. Just sharing my journey here on YouTube for fun and entertainment. If you're gonna go out 
invest in the stock market or anywhere else, please consult a licensed financial advisor first. Literally, just uh, doing my thing here on YouTube for your fun and entertainment. All right, everyone, if you enjoyed the video, please subscribe, like, comment, all of that means the world to me. And keep the questions coming. I'm going to answer a lot more. I know a lot of you have been waiting a long time on a lot of different questions. And I like to um, give each question the time that it deserves, so that's why it's kind of slow. But I'll, um, I'll eventually get to all of them. All right. Oh, by the way, I have a meetup coming up uh, for local people in the Bay Area. If you're a local pe person in the Bay Area... Um, sign up to my email uh, list. I'll link to it in the description below. This is just for Bay Area people, greater San Francisco area. Although I do have a friend who is driving up from Los Angeles. Um, so, um, so blessed uh, with the amazing community here. And we have a meetup coming up. So if you want to be informed about those types of local Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area meetups, join that list. All right, everyone. I will see you all in the next Dividend Investing Video.